Frame It Easy offers the easiest, fastest, and most affordable place to buy custom picture frames online. You can even upload your own art and have them print and frame it for you. Get any size you need in a variety of styles at a price that truly can't be beat. For more info, go to frameiteasy.com. Hey, before we get started, we have a special request for you, dear listeners. Would you please fill out a short listener survey for us? It will help us understand your wants and needs and figure out a few key things to make the show better. Please go to cleverpodcast.com slash survey to fill it out. And thank you so much. We totally appreciate you. When I was growing up, I just wanted to draw for a living, right? I never even allowed myself to see that as a possible future. There was no potential career in drawing every day. And so the fact that I can come into work and I literally sit down and I draw pictures every day, it's like bliss. I made it. I made it by making it. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie. I'm Amy, and this is Clever. And today we're talking to Bobby Hundreds of the Hundreds Streetwear brand. In addition to being a champion of streetwear, he's also an illustrator, writer, photographer, designer, and author. And he's got a law degree. I know. And law school is where he met Ben, his business partner in the Hundreds. But before that, back in the early 2000s, Bobby started blogging, and his blog and his voice gained a following. In 2003, he and his partner launched The Hundreds with only a fistful of dollars, a box of t-shirts, and a friend with a silk screen. And there's a documentary about streetwear he's been working on, plus a forthcoming book. He's got a fantastic story, so let's hear it from Bobby. My name is Bobby Hundreds. I live in Los Angeles, California. And I'm the co-founder of The Hundreds, but as far as what I do every day, it's everything and anything. I like to just make stuff, you know, so anything that helps me to keep this dream alive of just making things every day, I'm all for it. So we want to go back to the very beginning. We're always really curious about how people grew up, what their childhood was like. So what was your family like? Where'd you grow up? Uh, What kind of kid were you? I was the minority of a minority of a minority. I, I grew up in an immigrant Korean American household. I'm a middle son, so uh, middle child syndrome. Grew up in a town that was predominantly white and Latino at the time in Riverside, California. And I was also, I gravitated also towards more fringe interests like skateboarding and punk and art in general, which at the time was also very fringe and, and hopeless as, as far as career goes in, in my parents' eyes. So I think in a lot of ways, I grew up feeling very much like an underdog at best and maybe at worst, more like disenfranchised, marginalized and unheard. And so I think I always had like a little bit of a chip on my shoulder and I still do, you know, it's 38 years later and um, I'm still very much trying to prove myself and that I'm important and I'm, I have value and I want to be heard and have things to say. And so um, I don't think I've ever lost that piece of who I am. Yeah. Hmm. So that marginalized slash independent spirit sounds like you didn't get a whole lot of support from your parents on that. I mean, did you feel loved and just totally encouraged to do something more safe and stable? Yeah. So it's a very typical immigrant story, especially as far as if you're a Korean American or Asian American, I think there's a lot of people who can relate to it, but just people who come from first and second generation immigrant families probably understand as well. You know, America is a very special place and people come here from around the world from different cultures and cultural mindsets. You know, like if you're coming from Asia, you have a very Confucian mindset that is not so much about like individuality and like pursuing your own passions. And and uh, that's very much the American dream. And, and that's why I love living here. And I'm so grateful that my parents even came here to begin with. So yeah, in that regard, I'm in forever indebted to them. And I, and I feel like they love me in a sense of they sacrifice everything to provide a better future for their children. In other ways, yeah, I didn't feel tended to as uh, much as like a traditional Western household would be in the 80s and 90s. You know, the, the Beverly Cleary books I was reading and the Saturday morning shows that I was watching, like Family Ties, I was just like, 
my parents aren't <laughs> like that. You know, my mom was like a dragon mom. My dad was like a dragon dad. Like mm-hmm. I had like a B plus or even an A minus on a test. Like I got in trouble for that. So, you know, like I've always drawn and been interested in art and making things since I was a child. So they didn't leave all their friends behind and everything they'd ever known moved to a country where they didn't understand the language and culture virtually penniless so that their children could grow up to become artists, right? Like that's just completely counterintuitive, not what they came here for. They came here so that their parents could be, uh, so that their children could grow up to become doctors and go to Harvard and, Mm -hmm. and have these lucrative, very secure professional careers. And so I think they were really worried that I was just drawing all the time. Mm -hmm. I did okay in school. Like I was a fine student, but also had like a lot of behavioral problems. I was just hyperactive, very anti-authoritarian, you know, growing up between cultures, right? Like my parents are very strict, very strict, very first generation, very rule following, rule enforcing. You know, uh, we didn't speak at the dinner table. We were spoken to. And then I'm growing up in a westernized world where every kid is celebrated for being special. Everyone gets a trophy, uh, you know, (laughs) kids get to be whatever they want. You can be a rock star. You can be a pro athlete. And uh, the sky was the limit. So being stuck between those worlds, I think, was shaped me, but also was in very many ways frustrating and, and difficult to deal with for my parents. But it also sounds like it sort of forged both sides of your brain and that you had to be creative in order to assert your identity and you had to rebel into the person that you're supposed to be. And yet you still had to function in a situation where you didn't want to disappoint your parents or make them feel like you weren't grateful for your situation. That can be a good thing, too, to have to flex on both sides of your brain. You know, look, in hindsight, I don't regret anything. Right. You know, um, I grew up, we had a very tense relationship uh, growing up. As soon as I could move out of the house, I left. And for many years, it was a pretty cold relationship between my parents and I uh, for a number of reasons, like even more personal, deeper reasons, traumatic experiences as well, you know, but still, you know, I don't blame them. I think it's very difficult to move to this country again with nothing, you know, like they were scared and didn't understand the culture and just really were doing everything they could to survive. I can't really blame them for that. Like I can't blame them for the way they reacted or the the fears that drove them to control and discipline us in certain ways because they didn't know what was going on. And I grew up like spoiled with everything I pretty much needed. I was well fed. And at the end of the day, like I got to live out my dreams and follow my passions into creating something that I loved. So like it all worked out in the end. It sounds like it did. And it also sounds like you have a very, you have the view that we all get to at some point, which is that our parents were just doing the best they knew how to do at the time. It's something... Once I became a parent, I became very empathetic and more compassionate about the hardships Mm -hmm. of of parenthood and realizing that my parents had no clue what they were doing. Just like I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. There's no (laughs) rule book for this. Uh You know, no matter if I raise them too well and give them too much love, they'll be sheltered. There's like there's no it's a catch 22 all around. We're going to be blamed for doing something that will traumatize and negatively affect them for the rest of their lives. So I have a lot more empathy towards my parents and towards parents in general and, and my other friends who are parents and even towards myself and just forgiving myself for, for not being the best parent I can be all the time. I'm just like doing what I can. Yep. Yes. <laughs> We're all just doing our best. <laughs> We're all doing our best. (laughs) So I'm really curious because you talk about community a lot and building community and the community of streetwear. And you've also talked about being marginalized in your youth. Is there something you can pinpoint, a formative experience or, or some origin of your love of building community that you can tell us about that from your adolescence or something? Absolutely. So again, growing up a brown person in my community where there weren't a lot of people who looked like me, Asian, let alone Korean, I already felt like I didn't belong in many ways, whether that was put onto me by the culture and media or whether that was just me in my own head. I didn't feel like I necessarily fit in, especially in the 80s. Everyone cool was blonde, blue eyed and beautiful. 
and uh, you know there weren't a lot of people that looked like me in mainstream culture or just running the world in general. And so I gravitated towards communities that kind of embraced uh, people like me that were quote unquote an outcast or even like an iconoclast, right? So that would be like the skate culture because the skate culture was very much like a minority culture, mm-hmm. right? It, even though in the 80s, it kind of got a little bit mainstream and blown out with the Bones Brigade and Tony Hawk and, and pool skating and all, all that. By the 90s, it was pretty much a dead industry, kind of like a forgotten culture, subculture in, in a lot of ways in, in terms of the fashion, in terms of like the companies, they, weren't, they didn't really exist. There wasn't really much of a business around it. So the people who were really into it were people who didn't necessarily fit in elsewhere. We were square pegs and we were looking just for other square pegs to relate to. And so skateboarding provided that for me and the hardcore scene provided that for me. So just growing up in the Southern California hardcore scene, hardcore by its very essence is a music music genre that's not capable of going mainstream. It's not pleasant to hear on the radio, so it'll never make the pop charts. It's almost like built in a way to be defiant and not to fit in. So it, you know, it attracts a lot of people who haven't found their place in other genres. They don't feel like the popular jock at school. They're not the cheerleader that's listening to like Mariah Carey or whoever was the popular (laughs) artist of the time. And so like all those kinds of worlds to me, those underworlds were um, really interesting and intriguing because I knew that I would find some kind of brotherhood and sisterhood in these places because these people didn't really fit into their schools and into their neighborhoods and they would have less judgment and be maybe more open-minded and accepting of someone like I was. So in that way, those communities provided me with so much identity and taught me so much about myself that when we were building our brand with the hundreds, the entire concept and ethos behind it was distilled from what I had gained from growing up in the hardcore scene and and growing up in skate and growing up in these smaller subcultures that really were open to um, being inclusive, which is interesting because streetwear in many ways is an exclusive arena, but the way that we wanted to visualize our brand and the way we wanted to construct our identity as a brand was to be embracing and just like how I remembered those scenes were to me growing up. I'm starting to get a picture of somebody who's very careful in that sort of gray area between two extremes. In other words, your parents had a very strong cultural suggestion for how you should grow up, and you went off in another direction, and yet you're able to straddle both. And then in streetwear, you've also been able to maintain the inclusive sentiment that's so important to you while you're establishing yourself in an arena that prides itself on exclusivity. Yeah, I I would say you're absolutely right. You know, and every personality test I ever take, every Myers-Briggs, every whatever, Mm -hmm. I'm always straight down the middle. I'm, I'm not really necessarily one extreme or the other, even though I think of myself as being on some pole, but really most of the time I'm trying to bridge divides. I'm almost like an ambassador, a cultural ambassador in certain certain scenes. And uh, even in streetwear, when we got into it, and still to this day, we've been doing this now for 16 years. I like to emphasize the point that we are very much still a part of the community. I feel like I'm a fan still. Like, even though I own a brand and I work on it every day called The Hundreds, I'm still very much a fan of The Hundreds. I'm a fan of other brands. I don't, I've never looked at myself as elevating to a different tier. And I think my job and duty has been, and what I've really enjoyed, I I think more than anything, is to be the guy who takes you by the hand and walks you through these worlds where you wouldn't necessarily have had access to. So I just want to share like cool things all the time, like music I'm listening to, like, let me share it with you. I want to bring more and more people in. And so that way I'm I'm inside, but I'm still very much with an outsider mindset. And maybe that explains a lot of the hundred success is that, you know, we never lost sense of what the fan's perspective was and what the customer is because we are a fan and we're still a customer. And I think you just said something that's super key is that you're on the inside, but still with an outsider perspective. 
when I was doing research and I understood that you got a law degree, understanding your childhood and how you were raised, I can totally get why you would go get a law degree. It's a way to placate your parents. But at the same time, you were getting in there and able to get under the hood and learn how to tinker with the machine so you could change things from the inside. Absolutely. That was why I went to law school. I think there were two options put in front of me for my parents. You know, they wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer, right? Like, again, Asian immigrant parents, they're like, this is, unless you become a lawyer or a doctor, you're going to, you know, die broken in uh, in a gutter somewhere in this country. And they didn't see that there were so many other opportunities to make money and to make like very successful and happy livelihoods. You know, I, I didn't necessarily want to do either of those things. I, before I went to law school, I was freelancing a bit, writing, doing photography, and designing for a bunch of different publications, magazines, skate magazines, street culture type magazines. And uh, 9-11 happened, mm. and the media industry kind of dried up. The advertising withered away. It was hard for me to pull freelance gigs. And I just wasn't a good freelancer in general. Like I've just, I'm not a very self-disciplined. I, I couldn't <laughs> adhere to some type of a schedule. So I kind of went to law school in a way to appease my parents and, but also just as a way to basically a holding period so I can figure out what I was doing with my life. Mm. Um, but the other reason why I went to law school, as you said, was I figured, you know, I had a background in activism and, and so- social justice work and, I thought if I went to law school, I could really make changes from the inside in ways that I couldn't necessarily just get done by protesting on a street or signing a petition or like writing an essay about. I was like, maybe I can actually break some rules and make some new rules from within. And so that was probably the largest driving force behind why I applied to law school and and thought at that point in time that I was going to go into some legal related field. Yeah. That's so interesting. I totally, you know, maybe it's my designer's perspective or maybe because I'm a builder too, but I totally feel the same way that you do is I don't want to smash the machine. I want to understand how the machine works and I want to go in and make some improvements, improvements that everybody will be happy with, but I want to understand how it works in order so I can tinker with it and make it better, not just dismantle it. And then we don't have anything we can work with. (laughs) There's a real punk and destructive side of me that loves to break things. Uh, And there have been many moments in my life where I've done that. I've done it to other things. I've done it to other systems. I've done it even to my own company in a lot of ways. I'm a very self-destructive person. And then there's another uh, side of my personality that understands that isn't the most effective way for me. I think there is a place for that and a need for that. For me, I haven't seen large long-term benefits of working that way. And so I always end up back in a place where I'm like, maybe I need to rethink my approach and do it from within. And probably, I mean, as you can guess, the most relevant modern example of that is just politically what's happened over the last two and a half years in this country under this new administration, I think there was a period of time where I was just like, I want to break everything (laughs) and destroy and I'm angry, Mm -hmm. which a lot of people went through for the first year. And um, I think myself and many others are also now getting to a place of like, okay, we got that out. Like, let's actually make some positive substantive change in a way that has longevity and, and is sustainable. Yeah. Let's build some new shit. Some shit that's better. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've definitely seen that shift as well. You and I actually have a couple of things in common. I almost went to law school, (laughs) um, but ended up writing a blog instead. So I would love to hear a little bit about how you started blogging, why you started blogging, and then how that led to the founding of The Hundreds. Yeah, the hundreds owes so much of what we are and, and who we are today because we're a storytelling brand and very much rooted in in writing and, and stories. I can trace it all the way back to the blog. Our early success was founded upon the hundreds.com being my personal blog. This was in the early 2000s, but even before we started the company, I had a blog that was up and running because one of the team I was really into making zines. And that's just growing up in the punk community. I think 
zines were in the 80s and the 90s what, let's say, social media, Instagram, or Twitter is today. It was a way just to be heard because you felt like you were just getting lost in a sea of noise or mainstream culture wasn't really acknowledging you, especially back then the media was run by the big six, right? So you had certain media strongholds that told all the news and that funneled all the way down to like your favorite music magazine that you'd read. And so everything was kind of controlled by six different entities. Oh, and radio was so controlled too. Like the pop music that you could hear was so controlled. A hundred percent. You were listening to the same music. Everyone was listening to the same music that was paid and orchestrated by the same puppeteers. For our generation growing up, we got sick of that to a certain point because we started seeing the, that everything was fabricated and forced and artificial and, and also that no one was addressing our vantage points, right? It was a very specific vantage point that was being preached down to us and we thought that we had something to say. And, and me especially, again, like being a minority from a minority town, interested in minority activities and pastimes, I was like, there's no one out there who is speaking to me on a level where I feel like I'm being seen. And so zines gave us that platform, right? Even if there was only five people buying your zine, now five people were listening to what you Mm -hmm. had to say. Um, You can build that zine up to getting 20 readers, 100 readers. And you started going around the shows, carrying with you and selling for five bucks a pop, making a little bit of money, having a little bit of influence, and also now feeling very comforted in knowing that um, your voice was being heard and represented out there. And so in 1999, I think, or around 2000, Blogger, Blogspot launched, and I was obsessed with it because I was like, this is zines, but free. Like, the whole process is free, it's digital, and I can pass this link around to everyone who has access to the internet, who was everyone cool and, and relevant at that time. I had this blog that was up and running for a few years where it was just my journal. You know, there was no like Google Analytics, really hard to tell how many followers you had or who was reading. It didn't really matter. I was just kind of, as you recall back then, like we were just typing into a void and we're doing it because we loved it and we wanted to express ourselves. And it was like, here, read my diary. When Ben and I started the hundreds in 2003, again, the ethos behind it was very punk minded. And so I wanted to be the world's first transparent apparel brand. You know, it was streetwear as a term wasn't even really being used yet. And the idea of what streetwear was, was still formulating in a lot of ways, but an idea of an independent clothing company where you knew everything about the people behind it to the very second. Like you can see what I ate for lunch today, all the way to the music I'm listening to this week. I want you to know as much about me as possible, just so that like there's real honesty and truthfulness in this exchange. Up until that point, the clothing companies I supported, like Stussy and uh, Fresh Drive and Extra Large and Supreme, even like I love these companies and brands. I thought they were so cool in terms of their offerings, but I wanted to know more. Just like when I would go to a punk show and listen to a band, afterwards I could engage with that band. I could talk to the singer. I could hang out with them at the cafe afterwards and ask them about their politics. I was like, why doesn't that exist for a company as well? Again, this was very far pre-social media. And so I used my blog in a way where it would be considered what Instagram is today. Like I was literally updating three, four times a day, going back to my room, uploading to an FTP server, using a Dreamweaver, like revamping the website like twice a week, like just changing it, hacking the site, new flash pages. It was just very active and dynamic. It was just like this river of transmission between me and the customer. And so from the very first day, it felt very communal. It felt like very much like we were on the same level on the same plane. And, and the kids were there along for the ride and felt as much ownership in this company as we did. Yeah, you know, that's you building a bridge again, I really think. And I think the authenticity that is the punk movement, the DIY kind of scrappiness, has always been weary of posers because anybody who's not willing to live in the fringes and endure and share in those stories and partake in the hardships 
that are real in terms of rebelling against the status quo. If you're just going to show up and be a tourist in our scene, then we naturally have to be suspicious of you. So transparency and authenticity Mm -hmm. is something that's organic to that movement. It's because, like, you can be whoever you want to be. We just need to know that it's authentic. You being so transparent with building a brand was also, it sounds to me like it's you saying, hey, there's no reason why we can't build a community that also has commerce built into it, but it's not necessarily Mm. about the commerce. It's not about selling as many t-shirts as possible as it is about telling this story and using t-shirts as a bridge to connect people. A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, we have this mantra of people over product. Look, at the end of the day, I sell clothes. That's where I make my money. The brand does well. Does it do like exponentially well? Like, are we a gigantic, ginormous business? Like, I don't know, it's relative, but I don't think so. I have, I have a home. I have a car for my wife and a car for myself. That's it. And uh, the rest goes into just keeping this brand going and taking care of our staff here and, and being able, again, to make things every day. As far as like my happiness and success with this company, nothing rivals like that first high of like selling one t-shirt, you know, that, that joy of being able to make something, being able to pay my rent <laughs> and also going out to the world and seeing that it has some kind of an impact or effect on even just one person. Like if it affects one person to me or it affects like a billion people, to me, it honestly doesn't really make much difference. It's just like, okay, I'm not alone. Like, that's what I'm always searching for is just a connection. So if I can put one thing out there and to let me know that I'm here, I'm grounded on this earth, I have a purpose, I did something that, that changed someone's opinion or like made someone's life better in any type of way, then like I did my job for the day. And I don't know, I'm not a numbers guy, I'm not good with metrics. And so again, it doesn't, you can tell me I sold a hundred million dollars this year, or I sold like a million dollars this year. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, it's great. Just as long as I can pay my mortgage, pay for my children to eat, like, and I get to do this every day. I'm very good with that. I hear you. I know Jamie and I kind of started this podcast for the same way. And Jamie has her reasons for starting her blog. But yeah, you said typing into the void. We're having this conversation. And right now it's just the three of us. But we know we're going to send it out there into the world. And people are going to be impacted by it. And we're going to be building a bridge in some way. And I love, love, love that. Hold that thought. We'll be right back after this quick break. Digital product designers spend a frustrating amount of time searching for files, consolidating feedback from multiple sources, and never really knowing what changes have been incorporated and approved. That's why Josh Brewer, former principal designer at Twitter, founded Abstract. Like GitHub for designers, Abstract is your team's version-controlled source of truth for better design workflow. Companies like Intuit, Zappos, MailChimp, and thousands of others across 75 countries rely on Abstract to improve their design workflow. With Abstract, you can version design files, present work, request reviews, collect feedback, and give developers direct access to specs, all from one place. Sign your team up for a free 30-day trial today at www.goabstract.com. And Abstract's also offering a chance to win a $500 credit to their business plan. Just tweet at GoAbstract and mention you heard about it on Clever to be entered to win. I want to get back to you and about this documentary that you released recently that's sort of a love letter to streetwear. Six or so years in the making called Built to Fail. That's such an epic project, and I'm a fan of documentaries, and obviously for a storytelling guy and a storytelling brand, I guess this makes sense, but it's not a garment. So help (laughs) us understand how you took on that project and and how it came together. First, you're going to be crushed because I'm going to preface this entire story by saying this movie will probably never come out. Uh... And uh, that's... That's also part of the journey of this story. And it's a, it's a bummer for everyone else who is looking forward to seeing it. But as far as like what the entire project meant for me, it's actually, I learned a lot, which is really all that it was about. But yeah, six years ago, I had this idea. Basically, I'd written this list for Complex at the time called 
the 50 greatest streetwear brands. It was very subjective, is my opinion. It was also contingent upon my definition of what streetwear is, where because no two people have the same idea of what streetwear is. Like some people would say it's a you know it's P and B and and triple five soul if they grew up on the East Coast in a certain period. If you grew up in uh, in on the West Coast in the 90s, uh, you would say extra large and fucked. If you grew up in the 2010s, you, would, you wouldn't even acknowledge those brands. You would say that streetwear was like the hundreds and crooks and castles. And then there are people from the 60s and 70s who say like streetwear was Pachuco zoot suits and, you know, New York street gangs and stuff like that. So the idea of what streetwear is, the definition of it is so amorphous that when I released that list, there was a lot of controversy and a lot of discussion about it because people were saying, well, this is not how I would write my list and this is not what I would say streetwear is. And so it, got, it sparked this idea in my head of, okay, this list was my interpretation of what streetwear is. Now I want to know what everyone else's streetwear interpretation is because I've dedicated my life to working in this world, in this space of streetwear, yet no one can tell me what it actually means. It's kind of a weird existential crisis that I have. Like, imagine if, you know, you both work in design, but no one could actually tell you what design is, and it doesn't actually exist in a lot of ways. And so that was the uh, motivation behind the documentary. So I traveled the world, interviewed over 170 hours of footage, you know, 50 different subjects. I, I literally went from one subject to, I would ask, who do you think should be in this movie? And they would tell me, you know, suggest someone else. I would fly over and, and sit with that person and just did that for two years of filming and editing. The epilogue to this story, however, is that when we had signed on to do this documentary, no one wanted to take it on. Again, this is like early 2010s. Streetwear, although we thought it was a big thing and we thought it was going to be important, Studios, producers, production companies, investors didn't really see the value in it. They thought that this was also like before the success of many Netflix documentaries. And so there was very little interest in picking up documentaries because there was no money in it at that time. And then also just a very little interest in streetwear in general, like the fashion trends of that time were still very much about like Americana and denim and stuff like that. We signed on with an executive producer who funded the movie after we completed the movie, which was very much because he was the EP and because he owned the movie. Ben and I don't own any of this movie, surprisingly to a lot of people. It was on him to go out and sell it. He never got the value he was looking for against the movie. And then once he did find a deal, two days later, the allegations against Russell Simmons broke and Russell Simmons is a central character in the movie. And so the deal fell through. That's where the story is at now. It's still sitting there. It premiered at the LA Film Festival, uh, not last year, but the year before. Was it last year? I don't remember anymore. Uh, did really well. Everyone who has seen it loves the movie. It's, it's extremely important. I have an interview with Tommy Hilfiger in there who says he invented streetwear. Uh, Russell Simmons supports that. You know, there's interviews with John Mayer talking about like, his success and like his pack background in streetwear, which a lot of people don't know, ASAP Rockies. And, you know, it's, just, it's a great film. Um, a lot of pioneers, interviews you'll never get elsewhere. But um, as of now, it's, it's shelved until we figure out a way to re-edit this movie and get Russell Simmons out of it and find a buyer. But it's, it's sitting there. I think in the end, it'll work out. I just don't think it's going to come out anytime soon. I think what's going to happen is I will take it back at some point, open it up, and then do like a modern edition uh, edit to the film with current interviews. And then uh, basically it'd be like a 10-year project, which is totally fine with me. Like, I'm in no rush. Well, that's a good attitude. I do think it's interesting <laughs> with all the sort of social fallout that's happening. I, you know, one thing that we're not really talking about is the creative projects that are the casualties of, of some of this stuff. Yeah. Hey, uh, look, Russell Simmons is a monster. I didn't know. I don't want to support him or, you know, uh, uh, make a movie where he looks important and valuable in any way because, you know, he destroyed a lot of people's lives. So, like, screw that guy. I think it's really hard because, like, there's a lot of people who have that, who also made a really important creative contribution to a movement or a product or whatever, and like really push the needle forward. 
You know, like what would we do if we found out Picasso was like some sort of oh he is monster? He's yeah, an asshole. probably right. Yeah, I think but he like, is. <laughs> at the same time, like how do you discount the importance of someone's work? Anyway, speaking of creative process, and this obviously this built to fail documentary is like the ultimate (laughs) creative process. But I want to talk more about um, the hundreds and the blog. You mentioned in the beginning that you can't really even describe what you do anymore, (laughs) which is a challenge in the day and age of doing many, many different things on the internet. So I I would love to hear a little bit more about, you know, how you develop a collection or how you approach a topic as far as design process goes, from day one, any designer that comes on board, whether they're a graphic designer, apparel designer, if they're working in terms of visual communications in general, I tell everyone that everything here begins with a story. We're very much a narrative-based brand, and there's very much a purpose behind everything we do. So unless you have a sound reason, a story, a narrative that you can sell me against a design or a product being in existence, like I'm not going to support it, I don't care if it's on trend and we know we're going to sell hundreds of thousands of dollars of a piece, if it doesn't tie back into reinforcing our brand narrative in any way, if it doesn't highlight a different facet of a very complicated personality of the hundreds, I don't care. I think in the end that would actually devalue and degrade the brand by doing things that are out of character for us. So the stories always come first. I look for stories that come from Ben and my uh, past experiences, our backgrounds, um, and then also things that are very much happening within the team um, and their lives as well. So I don't want to discount people who are working on projects. I have a, our head apparel designer, her name is Erica. She's so talented and also amazing because we're a men's apparel brand. And as a woman, she designs men's apparel better than anybody else I know in our world. But she also has very different experiences growing up in LA Uh, being a woman, being Latina, and seeing the world through a certain perspective. And so there's a lot more influence from her in terms of the collection and aesthetic than it did back when I designed it entirely holistically by myself. Patrick, our creative director, is from Vancouver, Canada, and he very much grew up in the West Coast um, skate scene. But he also has like different interpretations of like what Western American culture looks like, um, being from Vancouver, things that he grew up with, I did it, and still we uh, reflect a lot of those opinions in our work as well. I don't know if the lay consumer, uh, the casual consumer necessarily appreciates how much storytelling goes into like literally everything we make down to the names of products. But I know I couldn't live with myself if I was just doing things just because. I've never been a fan of design just because or let's try this just to be different. Or there was this period of time in, in early streetwear early on when we were starting out where there are brands that just started doing like a lot of diagonal stuff on the bias and adding features to pockets and things that just really had no use. But it was just for the sake of design and to be weird. That speaks to a certain demo. But for me, it's never really resonated with me, that type of design. I was just like, what is the reason for that outside of like, let's just try just because I take it a little bit more seriously. And and so like, you know, maybe I take it too seriously as far as like my creative process. But when I look back on 16 years and the body of work of the hundreds, in my eyes, so much of it makes sense. So much of the things that we made back then can be worn today. And that was the point to just kind of be a timeless brand in terms of like, we don't exist within any time framework, but we just make good clothes that everything goes back to reinforcing a very strong core of what the hundreds message is. And when you talk about a narrative or a story, how does that story originate? Is there somebody who sits in your office who like writes something? Do you write a blog post? Like how does that, how is that story communicated to the team? It happens in different ways. Sometimes it just happens in conversation. A good example is, uh, let's say, okay, so early last year, I went to Paris Fashion Week. I was really just there as, again, um, insider, but also casual observer. So I'm sitting in in Virgil's show for Off-White. I'm I'm admiring his work. I'm admiring the theater of it all. It's very main stage. It's very pop. It's, It's paparazzi. And then I'm reflecting back on what I do back at home and... If you ask a 
certain streetwear customers, they'll say the hundreds is the mainstream, but there's also, in many ways, we're also still very much independent underground. You know, we're still owned by ourselves. Like we're not a gigantic company like off flight. And so I was kind of comparing and contrasting like what I do, what my role is, what Virgil's role is, uh, what high fashion's role is, and compared to like actually like on the street, street wear. And I started thinking of this dynamic between the underdogs and the champions and how you need both. And as I was going on, I was flying home and the movie that was playing on my chair was Rocky, the original Rocky. If you don't remember that movie, it's an incredible film. It's a love story more than anything. It actually has very little to do with boxing. You don't even see who wins the boxing match at the end, which is crazy. <laughs> it's awesome. But the movie, what, what's happening in that movie is that Apollo Creed is the superstar. He's like the Kanye West of boxing at the time. He's the big show. And Rocky is a virtual unknown. Apollo feels like he's losing some type of relevance because he's losing touch with his fan base. He's feeling inaccessible. He's feeling just basically so transcendent from what the world of boxing is that he needs someone to fight on an organic street level. And Rocky, meanwhile, is feeling the opposite. Rocky's feeling like he's the underdog. No one knows who he is. He knows he's a great fighter, but he just needs a shot. Like, just give me the chance to play. And so they find each other and you have this epic battle. And I then related that to that's what's happening in streetwear is that you need the high fashion, you need the main stage, you also need us on the floor doing the groundwork. And we both cannot exist without the other was very much a yin yang or very much a synergy. And so I wrote a blog about it on my flight home. And then that I came into work and we discussed doing a project with Rocky, a licensing collaborative project with that and starting to explore all the fashion of that time. And, and many people don't know the hooded sweatshirt was basically inspired and created because of that movie, because of the way that Rocky wore his, his hood under his sweatshirt. So then we started delving into all this old American sportswear. And now you have like a full story that began all the way with like an opinion or something that was just on my mind. And so there's like a real reason for it's not just the hundreds and Rocky, where it's like, what does that have to do with each other? Uh, we did our best in the months leading up to that to explain how this project came together. So when people are wearing it, it's not just a picture of Sylvester Stallone on a t-shirt. It actually embodies the spirit of the underdog and the champion needing each other to survive. I'm so glad we asked that question. That was an amazing story. <laughs> oh, and Rocky is like one of my all-time favorite movies. And I think yeah, that's you, it's, Bobby it's Hundreds. Awesome. You're both the underdog and the champion. Yeah, I think in many ways everyone is. I think you have to get to a place in your life where you have to acknowledge that you are uh, you have to go from a place where you were fighting like an underdog and then recognizing when you are the champion in that space. And for me, that was a real inflection point um, in my career. I would say like, I don't know, we've been doing this for 16 years. So maybe like 10 years into the brand, I would always kind of restrain myself and like imprison myself in this idea that I was the underdog because I, I so much of my identity was rooted in being the, the unknown, unheard guy. And I didn't really know how to thrive in a world where I was actually seen as a champion and doing well and, and had some kind of influence on a larger scale. And, and once I recognized that, that I was like not so much the underdog anymore and maybe I need to start fighting like a champion and there's a need for that as well, did I find a lot more enjoyment and success and, and the brand changed actually. So it changed my life and it changed the trajectory of the of my career and the work that I do also. That makes so much sense. And I, I think you're right. I think there's an underdog and a champion in all of us, but making that switch, yeah. figuring out when our identity is actually holding us back. Yeah. And so much of being an underdog means identifying against the champion, right? As, as the opposition. A hundred percent. So yeah. you, you have yeah. to be okay with ascending with the fluidity, I guess, of the relationship yeah. between the two. Yeah. Look, it's relative, right? So in, in some ways, I'm still very much an underdog. Like when I, when I, I was back in Paris Fashion Week this month, and in many ways, I'm still an underdog. I don't really belong in that world. I shouldn't be there. And I pride myself on that. I pride myself in being in a place where I don't belong. I love that feeling and feeling like I need to enter this space and overcome it and 
disrupt it. Like I hate that word. Let's say we're going to just break the system Mm -hmm. um, and do it in a way where I'm going to feel heard and represented again. And then I come back into our zone and I have to also realize I have a responsibility as a champion to take care, to be the Apollo Creed, to reach out to the young guys. So we are constantly collaborating with new designers, new brands that are trying to come up in the scene, highlighting them, trying to give them a little bit of a push because I know I can't exist unless I have them on board. And I think that was a mistake that the generation before me, as far as streetwear and street fashion was concerned, made in that they were not very helpful towards the, ne- the later generations, the new kids that were coming in. And those kids, and like me, ended up swallowing up a lot of their existence and, and they're very bitter for it. Mm. Um, I don't ever want to be that person. I never saw why that even needed to be. And I recognize that I need these small kids nipping at my toe, nipping at my heels putting the pressure on me, um, constantly forcing me to reinvent myself and, you know, not be lazy. Like I need them to survive and they need me to survive to just pave the way and and represent a larger framework of what streetwear is. So it's an ecosystem, you know, and you need to know where your place is. You need to know that everything you're doing is affecting someone else on the other side and what they're doing is affecting you. And it's not just about you and you didn't create your own success and everything is, you know, everything is related. And it's a humbling revelation to know at a certain point, like, look, I, I love this, this idea when we were starting that every success was coming because we were just so great. And now I look back and I go like, no, it's actually because Kanye did something that year that looked like something we didn't trickle down to us, or we got a break on cotton sales that year. So we had like a little bit extra profit margin. And so like, it, there's like, some of it was due to like, sure, like my hard work and like, I thought of things in a certain way. But so much of it has to do with what everyone else is doing. And you just have to acknowledge that and know where where you play. Well, you sound like you're pretty self-aware and also self-aware of the ecosystem within which you've been thriving. One thing that it's very comforting for people to relate to is some sort of fallibility. Is there a thing that hangs you up in your creative process? Is there something you get stuck on frequently? In a lot of ways... I know a lot of designers feel this. If I don't have the momentum in my life, I get very depressed and unhappy. I think as our world accelerates, as we all get better at what we do, we're dreaming bigger and faster and we're trying to get to things in ways that are in, uh, very unrealistic in, in terms of what we want out of life. Um, very impatient. It's probably the thing that I have the biggest problem with that I am not good with just like pacing myself um, in in a lot of ways. And so it's something that I'm constantly working on myself with. And then also just having patience with my team. Like, look, I'm a boss and I want my team to be at the same velocity that my brain is going. And when they're not, which is because it's impossible, I very much become like a Steve Jobs character and uh, angry and frustrated by the fact that we're not moving as fast as I want to. So uh, I think that's probably the, the, my biggest issue currently is that I feel like I'm getting stalled a lot because I can't output as much as I want to. That's kind of more theoretical, maybe not as like tangible, but I will say this. Do you guys know I'm writing a book or a book is coming out? I heard. Tell us. So I'm publishing a book in June. It's called This Is Not a T-Shirt. It's published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, which is really important to me because, you know, they're home to everyone from like T.S. Eliot to Joan Didion. And at the end of my life, I I really want to be considered more of an author than anything else, as more than even a designer, more than a, a business person. I hope I'm remembered for telling great stories. For the last two years, I've been working on this book, but everyone asks, like, what is the book about? I just say casually, it's a, it's a business memoir. And so your first thought is to think, oh, it's basically how he built the hundreds and how it's so big and cool and everything. That's maybe the first third of it. And the second two thirds is about how everything failed. We lost a lot of momentum and steam in the early 2010s for a number of reasons that I get into in the book. And dealing with the hardships of rebuilding, uh, reassessing and rebuilding and regaining traction back in our space. 
I think there's something going on in entrepreneurial culture. Like five years ago, you know, you had Sophia with Girl Boss on the cover, and it was very inspired. So lots of cool uh, career conferences, um, a lot of motivational, inspired stuff going on, TED Talks. And let's just say for the last five to 10 years, it's been more about inspiring people to follow their dreams and, and to take off on these certain career paths. From my perspective, what's been happening over the last couple of years is people are now hitting walls, realizing the hardships of what it's like to actually be an entrepreneur, the depression that comes with that, the struggle, the feeling like you're alone. I just wanted to address it because especially in street where we never tackle those issues, everything looks glorious. It looks like there's all these wild kids running around making millions, millions of dollars selling t-shirt brands on Shopify. When the truth is, is that it's a job like any other job and there's ups and downs and fashion has a lot of violent cycles and to not consider that a failure, but more the breadth and the story of the entire brand's existence. Like you need the peaks and the valleys and like uh, when everything was cracking and on on fire and, and unstoppable, I was very uninterested in the brand. I was very depressed. I felt very much alone and I hated what I did every day. And only when things became very complicated and difficult and they needed me back in the driver's seat, did I find joy in what I did again? And so I just wanted to relate that. So that's basically the gist of the book is, is understanding that sometimes you're just completely washed out and you're washed and you're unheard of, but you have to work yourself back. And when you come back, you're going to be even stronger. I love Man. That. I'm in. I'm reading that book. You've already (laughs) sold me the book. Yes. Do you feel like in your life right now, you're, you know, where you're supposed to be? And how do you know? I feel really good. I'm very content and and happy. Not content in like a lazy way, but I'm very, let's say I'm very appreciative of everything that I've been given. I have my health. I'm surrounded by good people. Um, Again, like my goal in life was just to make stuff. Like, I know that sounds weird for kids today who their idols are like, you know, driving Bentleys and have all this jewelry and they, you know, they're famous or whatever. When I was growing up, I just wanted to draw for a living, right? Because my parents didn't allow that as an opportunity. I didn't, I never even allowed myself to see that as a possible future. There was no potential career in drawing every day. And so the fact that I can come into work and I literally sit down and I draw pictures every day. It's like bliss. Like I I made it, you know, like, I don't know if kids will ever understand what that feels like, but it's a very little win for most people. But for me, like I made it, I made it by making it like I make stuff every day and I sell it to people. And it just blows me away that that happens. I'm so, so grateful for that. And then on top of that, I get to work with incredible people. My team is superior. I have an amazing partner in Ben who allows me to even do this. So like, look, my job today is to get to talk to you. You're awesome. (laughs) I don't know. I think I'm where I'm supposed to be. Like, do I want more? Of course. It's why I get up in the morning. Like I want more. I want to make more stuff, but I love where I am. I've always kind of loved where I am outside of, you know, when I didn't feel connected to the brand in those years where we were having like a lot of crazy success. I have a question. It's sort of an existential question. Like, do you think your primary instinct, like the very first inclination in you, is that to trust or to doubt? Oh, wow. Going back to what I said earlier, I, I always feel down the middle with these kinds of questions. When you ask me, like, pick a certain, I'm always both. I don't Uh know why my brain is like that. But, you know, if you ask my wife, I'm very much a pessimist. Ah. She's like, oh my God, he's such a pessimist. I think I'm just more of a realist, but I think, yeah, maybe I am a pessimist. I just was always expecting something to go wrong growing up because things just often went wrong and I was probably scared. But in a lot of ways too, I'm very trusting, you know, in my community and in people. I'm very forgiving in some ways. And in other ways, I have a list of people that I hate and like, you know, don't come near me, you know? So I don't know. I'm like a little multiple personality. So I I don't know where I I stand in all that stuff, but it's probably contextual. I think it's worth considering. It doesn't sound like you're driven by fear so much these days. No. But do you think fear gave you a little bit of your hustle in the, in the early years? 
Yeah, fear is such a great motivator. And fear not like fear in terms of I'm going to starve to death or fear that like, you know, I made the wrong choice or anything like more fear of, again, not being heard. Fear of not being heard, fear that my parents are right. The only way to make it in the world is being a doctor or a lawyer. Yeah. 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 Fear that they are right. And not just my parents, but anyone. Right. Anyone who uh, assumes or judges or uh, makes a decision about me without my input on it, you know, I'm going to prove them wrong. It's a very bratty way to be, but I'm still like that. If you go against me, like, I'll almost like point prove you to the point where, uh, you know, it's, it's self-defeating, you know, <laughs> like I'll point prove you just to prove that, you, you know, and my, I have uh, two brothers, I have an older brother and younger brother. They know all about that. They're just, Oh, here goes Bobby again on one of his rants. And, um, I love it. You know, I think it's hilarious. Now, when I was growing up, I was like super angsty and pissed off about it, but now I just do it. Cause I think it's fun. Like the sake of arguing and, and not even to win the argument, but just like being able to like use arguments and stuff like I love it. And that's, you know, I probably would have made a good lawyer. I was just going to say that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So besides your book, um, let's talk about the hundreds. What is a long-term goal for the hundreds? The first 10 years of the brand were kind of like a runaway success. And I think if we had developed this brand just five years after that, it would have been even a crazier success because the facility of the Shopify and and e-commerce and stuff like that. We didn't really have a lot of e-commerce play at that time. People were still very distrusting of online shopping, which is like, again, like crazy to think about. But we had this crazy success. We were very much unstoppable. Like I could make anything and it would sell out. I could set it at any price, it would sell out. And as I was saying earlier, I didn't love it because I felt like I wasn't really necessary in the equation and no one was really looking to me to pilot the ship. It was on cruise control and everyone was just kind of doing the routine, just kind of like following the pattern. And it was not creative work, you know, it it was, it was lucrative work, but it wasn't very challenging and it wasn't compelling. So people weren't necessarily engaged and enthusiastic to be at their jobs every day. The company grew really big. We had over 100 people by the early 2010s, which is very difficult to manage for someone like me. It might surprise you, but I'm very much an introvert and I'm not a good manager. Much of my job became administrative, replacing people's chairs because they were hurting their backs, uh, listening to people like bad mouth me. And I just was like, I'm not a good boss. I'll never be a good boss. I'm not even a good leader. You know, I just like to make stuff on my own and somehow this all happened. And so the company in, in a lot of ways got away from Ben and I. We felt very much out of control of the brand and its destiny. It started uh, appealing to a lot of people who wanted to invest and, and a lot of you know, money hungry people who were looking at us like as we were dollar signs and not really seeing what we were contributing to culture and contributing to design. Ben and I kind of made a conscious decision a few years ago to scale the company back and do it on our own terms. We did that very deliberately, very, very skillfully and slowly. It's been a gradual two and a half year process now. Uh, where everything's just running more efficiently. We, uh, we don't go on sale very much anymore. We don't make a lot of inventory. We, it, the business is very clean and efficiently run. And we're still in a way editing down to get it to a point where we feel like the staff is manageable. We're at like 40 to 50 now. It's like pretty much exactly right. We're making things that we're very much proud of. I know the names of all the products we make. I know how much of everything we make, which Again, like it may sound strange, but there's many years where I was just like, I don't even remember making that because maybe I didn't make it like a junior designer had made it and I never even saw it in the pipeline. So I'm very much connected back with the product again, my fingerprints on everything. I'm sitting in every design review and I'm so involved in the process and I have a lot of joy in that and, and, and the people on board uh, in the company to feel my involvement and love it. Separately, Ben and I, for the last 10 years, We've always kind of been incubating and like helping other brands and investing in other and partnering in other brands. It didn't really work for the first part of that. And not until recently, um, over the last two to three years, have we been partnering with some smaller brands in the space who've become really big and notable. 
And so uh, we found a new lane where we've basically developed a company that's like a machine that does all your work for you, where you can just have a brand, you can have an Instagram handle, you can do the marketing, you can be the face, whatever you want, enjoy the cool parts of it, the fun, sexy parts, and we'll take on all the unsexy stuff like logistics and shipping and accounting or like even like targeted marketing stuff. Like we do all of it in-house. I think there's a real need for that in not just streetwear, but just in any industry. It's very easy to start a business through a Shopify card, through an Instagram link. And if you just have like a good photographer and so you can make some product, it's really easy to make product now where even back when we started, it was very hard to make product. And so um, people, young people are starting brands, finding success very fast, especially if they get a celebrity involved or endorsing it, making a million dollars out the gate, you know, first year. And then they hit a wall where they're like, I don't know how to actually build a proper business or I don't care to build a proper infrastructure around what I do. And so we're like, just bring it over to us. And so we end up partnering with these small brands and that's become a whole monster in itself. And it's been really fun. Wow. I love that too. I love that sense of community, like your dedication to, you know, growing this community. I mean, it's lucrative. Obviously, it's like making a lot of money for everybody. But my favorite part about it is I get to work with these young designers who wouldn't necessarily be able to realize their potential or their dreams um, without us kind of coaching them and big brothering them along the way and watching young designers, a new generation of kids kind of becoming important and, and, and contributing like amazing things to the culture and just seeing like how excited they get by that, knowing like I had a hand in that, even though my name's not anywhere on it, I don't need that. It's just more for me to know, like it's our way of giving back also in a lot of ways. So it's fun. You know, if you come down to our office, it's like a never, never land over here. This is <laughs> brands and people everywhere, designers and photographers shooting stuff. And it's just crazy. It's like half of it's the hundreds and half of it. It's like other people doing awesome things. I think it's your way of supporting the ecosystem too. And on some level, supporting that ecosystem yeah. means protecting it from deterioration and pollution and situations where, yeah. you know, good brands can't thrive. And so yeah. you, you're taking everything that you've learned and all the resources you have and putting it back into keeping the ecosystem thriving. And I think that's really beautiful. I didn't think about it like that, but yeah, this so, is like so refreshing. You guys are really smart. <laughs> I'm learning so much by listening to you. I'm just learning so much. <laughs> I'm interested in knowing if you personally have a long-term goal or what's next for you. I know your book is coming out in June. I assume you're going to do some sort of book tour. Are there any other goals that you have for yourself? So the book's coming out in June, but I've already been taking a lot of movie and TV deals against it. So it'll probably turn into something visual um, at some point. I didn't necessarily think about that going into the book, but I think there's a real desire and a thirst for this kind of story right now. Obviously, streetwear is trending, but also just like from an entrepreneurial perspective, just providing solace for people who are looking to building their own company, but and also knowing how to deal with the hardships of it and keeping a perspective about it. There's a lot of interest on, in that end from like the Hollywood side. And that's cool. Look, I want to be an author. Like I want to write books. I want to get into fiction. You know, I want to write like a modern day outsiders. You know, I want to I write YA because I've always had, for whatever reason, a real a uh, heart for younger people, I think, and just teenagers and what young people go through. I think it's a really, it was a difficult time for me and I know it's a difficult time for them and I feel like teenagers run the world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'll probably write stories for them, but, you know, I just want to write a lot. Like the way that I felt about designing and the way that I, I still feel about design, like I got to design some t-shirts yesterday in the office and it's like, I'm just, I feel like I'm flying. Like when I'm in a real state of flow, like whether I'm surfing or whether I'm designing, like I feel, I always say it's the close, it's the closest I'll ever feel to flying. Like I feel like I'm moving so fast and I'm free over the last five years, seven years, I'd say I've gotten that feeling from writing in a way that I never had before. And um, I think what a lot of that had to do with was enough people telling me like, Hey, you're a pretty good writer 
to allow myself to think of myself as a writer because before that I was like, no, I'm just a blogger. And they're like, no, you're actually like, you're a pretty good writer. Like you, you're, you're a writer. And I'm like, oh, am I? And once I started saying like, yeah, I'm a writer. Then I went out and I got the book deal. And then I was like, oh, okay, I can write. Like, let me write. That's kind of what I'm looking at for this next phase of my life. Maybe like the rest of my life is how can I write more and then build further content around that, whether it's film or TV or just a way for those stories to live on. But in a lot of ways, what The Hundreds is, is just like a giant book that I've been writing. And so that in itself is a story. So, you know, it might, my stories may end up turning into a restaurant chains and my stories may end up turning into books and movies, but I just want to keep writing stories and telling stories. We want that too. So our listeners will probably want to continue listening to your stories and finding out where they can get your book and everything. So can you list out where people can follow you on social media personally, and then also the hundreds brand? You can follow me across all social channels at Bobby hundreds, H U N D R E D S. And uh, the hundreds is the same. It's the hundreds uh, across all channels. And that book uh, of mine, it's called, this is not a t-shirt by Bobby hundreds and it can be pre-ordered on Amazon. Now there's no cover graphic yet. That's still coming into play, but um, that link is there. And uh, I would really appreciate it if you supported it just because it's my first book and I'm nervous about it. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be awesome. I'm sure it is too, but I just also want to <laughs> let our listeners know that pre-orders are super important for books because it lets the publishers know how much demand there's going to be. So pre-order it guys. Also, oh, thanks. we want to know where your blog is. Tell everybody the URL where they can find your blog. If you want to read my blog, you can go to thehundreds.com. And in the corner, it says Bobby's blog. It's not updated the way as frequently as it was in the past. But actually, that's about to change. And we're currently reformatting the website to bring my blog back in a way it hasn't been since like 2010 because uh, I just have even more to say, shockingly. Um, <laughs> I have more to say than I did back then. And uh, I'm, I don't know, this is a whole different conversation, but I have this thought about blogs and I think they're really important and necessary. And um, they're probably not going to make you a ton of money, but I just think that they're valuable to the world and um, in a way that social media cannot provide. I think through social, it's very much just like, you're locked into somebody's presence and you kind of have to like, they just shove all this content down your throat. And I like this very like non-aggressive way of like having content and editorial and written stuff on a blog living somewhere that I update every day. And if you want to come to it, you can. And like, I've never been a salesperson. I don't like going on my Twitter saying like, click on this link and read about this. I just would rather let it live. And if you find it, you'll share about it. And if not, like, it's all good. I'm doing it because I just want to write. I love that. I feel like, you know, if you make good work and somebody finds it and shares it, like, that's the ultimate sales tool, right? I mean, word of mouth is the best way to get people interested. It's also a way for you, I think, as the author to keep it kind of clean and pristine in that you don't have to drive traffic there. And because the minute you like have to, or it becomes part of whether the blog itself is sustainable or not for you, then the joy of writing gets commodified and then it gets, yeah. Yeah. You get pressure to create and then that can ruin your creative process. I mean, there's a whole thing about it. Man, Bobby, (laughs) I I want to have more conversations with you. Can we do this again? I want to, I want to part two. This has been so awesome. And I think you're really smart, really insightful person. And I love your perspective on life. life. I love the way you're able to see things from the inside and from the outside. That's a really important skill. And I know it. I've read your blog. It comes out in your writing. I can't wait for this book. And uh, thank you. This has just been one of my favorite hours of my life. So thank you. (laughs) Thanks for listening, everybody. To see images of Bobby and his work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
And if you would, please do us a favor and rate and review us. It really helps us out. We love to chat with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us there at Clever Podcast. Clever is created, produced, and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Struffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.